Welcome to Thread Safety in Python, Locks and Other Techniques. My name is Christopher, and I will be your guide. In this course, you'll learn about a variety of ways to manage race conditions when coding with the threading library, including two kinds of locks, semaphores, and several ways of doing atomic signaling between threads. The code in this course was tested in Python 3.13. Most of the threading stuff has been around for a long time, so any supported version of Python should be sufficient. In one very small piece of code, I use the batched function from ITERTOOLS, which was introduced in Python 3.12, but it only saves me a couple lines of code, and you could work around that if you want to use something earlier. There are several different ways of creating code that supports parallelism and concurrency in Python. One of the lower level primitive libraries is threading which is a wrapper to your operating system's thread capabilities. Threads are leaner than multiprocess code because they share the same interpreter state. But that leanness through sharing is a bit of a trade-off. As most operations in Python aren't atomic, shared spaces can lead to race conditions, where the timing of when two threads fight to make a change affects the final outcome. In this case, your code is no longer deterministic, which typically is problematic. To deal with race conditions, you need to add atomicity to your code. Thankfully, the threading library has a variety of tools to help you do just that. Locks are a way of ensuring only one thread can run a managed block of code at a time. Semaphores are thread-safe counters, and they can be used to limit how many threads use a resource at the same time. And events are ways to signal information between threads. There are also two other mechanisms that combine these ideas into higher-level primitives. Conditions are locks that can perform signaling, while barriers are locks that prevent execution of a block until enough threads have arrived at that point. This is not an introduction course on threading or concurrency. The next lesson will do a quick review on some threading code and introduce a race condition, but if you've never done concurrent coding in Python before, this course might not be the best place to start. I'm going to assume you have familiarity with the threading library, have seen thread pool executors before, have a grasp of the idea of race conditions, and some glancing familiarity with the gill. Don't worry, RealPython has content that covers all of this stuff, so if you stumbled across this course first, I can point you where to start instead. The Speed Up Python with Concurrency course covers all those things I just mentioned and more. It teaches you the difference between IO bound and CPU bound parallelism, how to use the threading, async IO, and multiprocess libraries, and about some of the challenges of concurrent coding like race conditions and the GIL. You don't need deep knowledge of the GIL for this course as long as you understand that it isn't a solution to most race conditions. But if you are interested in a deeper dive, this course covers Python's favorite feature to argue about in detail. Great, so I haven't scared you off. Then let's get started. In the next lesson, I'll cover a threaded program and introduce a race condition. In the previous lesson, I gave an overview of the course. In this lesson, I'll give you a refresher on Python's threading library and what a race condition looks like. The code in this lesson will be the basis for the fixes introduced in later lessons. Threads allow two chunks of code to appear to run at the same time. In reality, the operating system is swapping back and forth between them quickly. As a lot of time is spent in software waiting for things, this can give you speed up. As one thread waits on some data to come back from the network, the other can be working. The key to this, though, is that it is the operating system that decides when to swap threads. Threads operate in the same memory space, so if you've got values that two or more threads are changing, you have a problem. Python is an interpreted language. And although the underlying bytecode instructions might be atomic, a single line of Python typically translates into multiple bytecode operations. That means there's a chance that a thread can be swapped out partway through a single line of Python. This can be dangerous and can result in a race condition. Race conditions are where the timing of operations affects the end result. This is the opposite of what you typically want in your code, which is determinism. I'll start out by showing you a threading example with a race condition in it. My bank charges me a monthly service fee. It feels way out of proportion for the services they provide, but that's just banks being banks. If I keep enough money in my account, they rebate the fee. So every month I see a charge and a refund. 
This means somewhere in the bank is a script that goes through and charges and refunds a whole bunch of accounts. To do that quickly, you might want a multi-threaded program, which is what I'm going to show you next. This is my approximation of that banking script. Since this course is all about dealing with race conditions, I want to make sure I can reliably cause a race condition. Although the operating system can swap between threads at any time, if I add a delay into the code, I can increase the likelihood of this happening. To experiment with that a bit, this highlighted line grabs the first argument to the script and turns it into a float value, which will determine the delay that gets used. My bank account object has two key methods, one for withdrawing and one for depositing. This code here is what changes the balance during the withdrawal. I've got a sleep in the middle of it to try to increase the chance of a thread swap. Yes, you could combine the subtraction and storage lines here into one, but then it's less likely for the swap to occur between them. I get that this is a little convoluted, but it makes the race condition happen consistently, which is good, because that means later you can see whether you've removed the problem. Same idea here for the deposit. Instead of subtracting from the balance, I add, and again, there's a delay between that as well. Let me scroll down a bit. To maximize our chance of a thread swap, I'm going to perform a number of withdrawals and deposits from a number of different accounts. This function is a wrapper for applying the service fee to every one of the accounts in the system. And then this function is the reimbursement. If there was no threading, the final balance in every account after these functions have run should be the same as before. Fee charged, then fee reimbursed. Here, I'm creating 50 accounts, each with $1,000 in them. And this is where the threading happens. There are a few different ways of creating threads, but I like the thread pool executor. I especially like that it can be used in a context block, meaning you don't have to remember to manually clean your threads up. For this example, I'm going to use only two threads. One is for charging the fees, and one is for reimbursing them. It is possible in this case for any given account that the reimbursement might happen before the charge, but for our case, let's ignore that. The end result would still be the correct balance if there isn't a race condition. The final step in the script is to print out the results. I use the iter tools batched function to break my 50 accounts up into five batches and then print out the balances for each account in each batch. I'm using the end argument to the print call so that the line feed isn't applied automatically, thus allowing my 10 batched accounts to print on a single line. The final print is there to force the carriage return after the batch. Let me open a shell and I'll try this out. I'll start with a delay of zero. Looks good, right? All 50 balances are what they should be. Why'd this work so smoothly? Well, the default switch time between threads is small, but the amount of processing time to do the work here was even smaller. That means that what probably happened was one thread ran and finished before the other even started. So there's no swap, so there's no problem. By the way, if you want to know what your thread switch time is, you can call the get switch interval function in the sys library. On my machine, it's five milliseconds, which doesn't sound like a lot, but you can do a whole bunch of computing in that little time on a modern machine. Okay, let's try this again, this time with a delay. Waiting on the threads. And there's the results. Not so good this time around, huh? Not one of the values is correct. 10 of them were overcharged and the other 40 got a nice surprise. It's like that card in Monopoly, bank error in your favor. Collect $14.95. Of course, if you're the bank, that's a problem. So why'd this happen? Remember this line? At this point in the code, the balance hasn't been updated. Let's say this line runs, and then during the sleep call, the other thread wakes up. That thread accesses the balance for its own calculation, and since the withdrawal hasn't updated the balance, the deposit gets the original balance of $1,000. It then finishes updating the balance. Then, if the threads swap back, the new balance value here is still based on the calculation from the original. When this line runs, the balance gets updated without taking into account the change the deposit completed. Since the deposit is already done, the final result is just the withdrawn, 
giving you 985.05. It's as if the deposit portion never happened. And of course, if the swap happens during the deposit phase instead, you end up with 1,014.95. This is our race condition. Now that you've seen the problem, in the next lesson, I'll show you a possible solution. In the previous lesson, I introduced you to our banking problem and how a race condition means the wrong balance. In this lesson, I'll show you one solution, adding atomicity in your code through locks. The way to create atomicity in programs is to have a locking mechanism. The global interpreter lock is just such a device. The GIL is a CPython implementation detail that ensures thread safety around memory management routines. It's a bit of a compromise. You don't want race conditions on memory management, otherwise you'll leak or overwrite memory, which is bad. But the GIL isn't such an aggressive lock that it gets rid of all race conditions, just those at the low level. Like with all locks, when the GIL is engaged, all threads have to wait until it's unlocked again. This limits the amount of concurrency you can do with threads in Python. Whether your code needs a lock or not, under it all there is one big lock that can get in the way. This is why it's recommended to only use threading for I.O. bound code. If your code is CPU bound, the GIL is likely to remove any sort of parallelism you thought you would have. And if all that isn't complicated enough, remember a second ago when I said the GIL was a C Python implementation detail? Well, one consequence of that is the implementation detail can change. In fact, some sample code I wrote in another course to show off a race condition all of a sudden stopped having a race condition in it. That happened because of changes in the interpreter about when the GIL was locked or not. So in one version of Python, the race condition is there, and in another version of Python, the GIL was accidentally taking care of it for me. Of course, you shouldn't be dependent on this at all. Future changes to Python may cause the assumption you made about the GIL to be wrong, and that's without getting into the ongoing work to get rid of the GIL altogether. So you can't trust the GIL to solve the race condition problem for you. And even if you currently don't have a race condition because the GIL is taking care of it, there's a chance that won't be true in all versions of Python. Instead, you should use your own locks, putting them in the part of your code that needs protection. This way, you are in full control of when your code is atomic or not. The first lock I'm going to introduce you to is the lock class in the threading library. It has two key methods. The first, acquire, is a blocking call. Your code stops here until it obtains the lock. If your code has the lock, all others attempting to acquire it will be blocked until you're done. And the second method is release, which is how you release a previously acquired lock for future use. The essence of this is only one thread can acquire a given lock at a time. Instead of using acquire and release, I recommend using the lock as a context manager instead. The controlled block won't be entered until the lock has been obtained and will automatically be released on exit of the block. Using a context manager is the best way to use locks as it means you won't accidentally forget to release a lock and create a situation where your code will block forever. Let's revisit our banking service fee problem, this time with a lock to make our account changes atomic. You'll need the threading library as that's where the lock object lives. And this is how you construct the lock object. For our situation, each instance of an account object gets its own lock, and that works fine. Account 1 doesn't have to wait if account 2 is being updated. This works because the different accounts don't share any information. Here, I've moved all of our balance changing code inside of a context block based on the lock. This block of code won't run until the lock has been acquired, and the lock will get released once the block exits. Let me scroll down a little. Don't forget, you have to make all the code that uses a shared resource atomic, so I need to lock in both the withdrawal and the deposit code as well. Inside the deposit code, I have the same idea as I do in withdrawal. Now that I've got a lock surrounding the two blocks where the balance gets updated, you won't be able to complete a withdrawal and deposit at the same time. The code in each of the methods is guarded by the lock. Oh, one small thing I kind of skipped over. Since using a delay of half a second consistently caused our race condition, I have hard-coded it this time around, so there's no arguments anymore. All right, let's try this code out. Running the script.
and there you go, all clean. The race condition has gone away. The lock is the core primitive of mutual exclusion in programming. In fact, every other synchronization mechanism from here on is built on top of a lock. To save you having to code more complex mechanisms yourself, though, Python provides a bunch of other choices. In the next lesson, I'll show you a variation on what you've just seen called the reentrant lock.